Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this week's webinar. One quick item I'd like to share with you. We will have a webinar again next Friday. However, we will not do the webinar on Friday, July 3rd. So yes, next week, no July 3rd, and then we'll resume with those Friday webinars on July 10th. And with that, I will hand it over to Val. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us again. I know people are still calling in because I could see the numbers going up. Uh, oh, oh, I lost my thing. Let me borrow yours, <laughs> sorry. I grabbed some papers, but not all the right ones. So a uh, little update from the fusion cell, and we'll go do that first, Taika, is um, the Missouri Hospital Association on Wednesday posted regional COVID-19 data. Uh, so it's a great tool. It's available for everybody to use. It's on their website. So Heike is pulling it up right now. And if you'll see there, it says weekly regional dashboard. So these will be updated every week. And Heike, go to the Southwest region. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, the Southwest region is now a hot spot that the state is monitoring. I did not bring my numbers in with me, but McDonald County, Newton County, and Jasper County are all um, seeing increases in cases. Uh, we do know there are some poultry processing plants down there that are doing major testing at this point. Also a lot of other testing opportunities down there trying to figure out who's positive, how many positives there are, all, all of that. But in the meantime, there is still a lot of uh, positives occurring in that area. So that's why we're gonna show that one just to give you some framework. And if you look at this, the first one is prevalence for the Southwest region is that box down there in the light like, middle. And statewide or regional prevalence, case rate per 100,000. And again, you look at case rates per 100,000 so that you can get a good compare. Oh, no, stay there, Heike. So that you can get a good comparison of um, what's going on with your county across the state. So while the Southwest region only has 75.8 cases per 100,000, that is a very large region. It's probably the largest region we have in the state. But you can see that in McDonald County, they had 373.6 cases per 100,000. And this is from data up until Wednesday. So this is not the most up-to-date data. There was more coming on there. So that number is only going to get higher. Uh, same for Jasper, Jasper and same for Newton. So, we like this because it really gives you a good idea of what's going on around your area. The next box I want to point you to is a box called reproductive rate. And reproductive rate is the rate at which the uh, COVID-19 infection is spreading in the community. And you want that reproductive rate below one. If that reproductive rate is below one, then what that's saying is that if you have COVID-19, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to spread it to anybody else. But as that reproductive rate gets above one, if you have COVID-19, then you're going to spread it to somebody else and they're going to spread it to somebody else. And as those reproductive rates go up, sometimes those are two and sometimes those, those can be three. When we started this at the very beginning, our reproductive rates were between two and three. So we don't like to see those going up. Now they're not going up a lot right now. And hopefully that testing in that area and getting folks um, so it's isolated, quarantine will help a lot. Okay, scroll down. And we've shown you these next slides before, even on a regional basis, but they're the projected hospitalizations in the Southwest region. And the yellow line is the median, so where you think it's gonna be. The blue line is the low, and then the gray line is the high. So it's gonna fall somewhere in there where we think hospitalizations will go, are trending right now for the Southwest region. Obviously, we want to see that blue line be our reality. Um, cumulative case deaths of the Southwest region, so that is on here. And uh, Google Mobility Index, so this shows you how much traveling is happening in the Southwest region. And again, the blue line represents are we above or below the median deviation from the baseline of travel for that time. And then the, the, at the end, it shows you kind of where we think we could be going for travel. So travel is up in the Southwest region. Scrolling down, I like this box down here that says one week difference in the Southwest region. So it shows that hospitalizations are up 18 over one week for the Southwest region. Ventilated patients are up one over one week for the Southwest region. New admissions is not a category that we we're working on getting as part of data that we get through a national data source, so that's really not available yet. 
New cases, 117, one week difference in the Southwest region, and death one, which is a one week difference in the Southwest region. The next one over talks about ventilated patients in the Southwest region. So they have had uh, days of consecutive decline, two days of consecutive decline. So that is good overall in the number of patients. So the blue line is the number of people hospitalized, the orange is the number of people ventilated. So overall, hospitalizations are going down in the Southwest region for the last two days. Now, again, hospitalizations are a lagging indicator. So generally people test positive and then as they get sicker, they go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll be watching this closely over the next two to four weeks to see what happens here. Going down, and I, and I want to make sure you guys understand that. I mean, you, we have to look at these every week and we have to watch them for this isn't going away. And I think these help people visualize that this is not going away. Um, okay, scroll down, Heike. Hello? Did I lose us? Okay. Um, she can't scroll down right now. I'm guessing it's stuck for some reason. There's also a lot of really good testing information down there on the number of tests that we've been performing in a week. So uh, that, I wanted to just kind of talk through that a little bit. That will show you that the number of tests we've been performing in a week is down but are not to the level we need it to be. One of the challenges is actually getting all the data into the right place. So while we want that to actually show positive, right now that is showing kind of as a negative, but again, we don't have all the data for the last week that that's reporting on. And we know we're getting more of that data in all the time. So that's another one where as the technology gets better, the data gets a little bit more easy for us to get more quickly and that will look a little bit better. So I just wanted to give you that. I know we sent that out across the state um, in our down wide, downstream provider message on two, Wednesday. We sent it out the day that it came out through Missouri Hospitalization. I know the folks uh, with Missouri Association of Counties, uh, MAC DDS folks, I know that you're going to have a presentation on that during your meet, our Zoom meeting on Thursday from the Missouri Hospital Association. So she will really be able to dive into that data and let you know, kind of talk you more through it and answer specific questions you might have about it or what they really, really pay attention to. So um, that is that testing update. Testing continues to be a priority for all of us. Um, we are working, uh, and thank you to all of the community providers that are answering our requests that are in search of testing. And thank you to the SQHCs who are reaching out and partnering with us to get this testing done. Um, we haven't got a lot of reports, and I know that there's testing happening and that, that we're not getting those reports in. So I, I really need those reports daily so that I can keep the governor's office updated at our level of testing. I understand that that's challenging and we do the best with what we have every day, but I haven't had a DD provider report testing in the community this week. And I'm pretty sure we have DD community providers doing testing at this time. So please, please, please report that information so that we can keep it in our boxes and keep everybody happy with us meeting our Department of Mental Health testing goals that we've set for ourselves. And do the survey link. And do the survey link. Yes. It yeah, it goes into the survey link, mm -hmm. which we at DD Mail, it's got its own account and everything. So please, please send those in to us so that we can keep that up to date. Um, just so you know, we have the same challenges on our own state operated side, partly because we've been in that rhythm for so long, it's just really easy to forget, oh yeah, I needed a report 30 tests today or 40 tests today or 10 tests today. But that's fine. Just please, please, please report that information to us. I do not have a budget update at this time for you. Uh, nothing has changed between this week and last week. I do know that we are getting some questions about the CARES Act funding and the CARES Act application. So that is not us. That's the federal government. We've not filled that application out yet, have we, Gary? No, I mean, we will be filling it out for the state because the state's a Medicaid provider. But um, we have not done it yet, so we cannot a answer your questions on that um, or your frustrations. We're still learning and looking at it also. So, um, but uh, somebody, I'm sure somebody will have it all figured out. They can probably reach out across those associations and you guys can work together. Also, if you are a TCM provider, you're probably a Medicaid only provider. You probably also will be able to access funding through this CARES Act funding. So it's not just for our our waiver service providers, it's also for our TCM providers. We think, we don't know, but we're gonna try because the state's a TCM provider. A lot of you may be wondering why I'm trying to access this funding, 
Any funding that I can find that I, I can use to offset other core reductions or expenditure restrictions in our budget, I'm going to do. So that's why the state as a provider is trying to access this funding. If we could turn around and give that to general revenue, then those maybe could lead to less cuts we have to take later. So that's why it's important for us to figure out how to do it also. Um, the governor also on the 15th, which may have been Monday or Tuesday, I don't remember, my days get all messed up now. Um, they issued through the Department of Health and Senior Services guidance for visitations, transitions at Missouri long-term care facilities. And so that guidance um, includes how to do facility visits, our ICF ID facilities, so the HAB centers fall under this guidance because they license us. Again, this is just guidance. So I uh, want to make sure people understand that. And it's very clear in this guidance that the facilities have the decision on when to make the final decision to allow visits. But right now what we're looking at, and according to this guidance, um, and I'll just kind of go over this with you briefly so that you understand, and we'll, it's, it's posted out there and we will send it out to the downstream providers also. Um, the facility, facilities may want to consider the following when allowing visits. The facility has not had any COVID-19 staff or resident cases or has it has been at least two incubation periods, 28 days total, since the last facility acquired COVID-19 positive case. So they want to make sure that you've been clear of COVID for at least 28 days. Um, and part of the way that you know that really as a provider is if you've had some testing done. Um, so I just want to make sure people understand that. They want to limit the visits to outdoor visits um, and only if the residents are COVID negative or not suspected of having COVID. So if someone's running a fever, if someone's nose is running, any of those symptoms that fall in the COVID category, they should probably not be seeing visitors. That's what that part means or otherwise COVID negative because we know that they're negative. So negative and no symptoms, that would be when it would be good time to see visitors. Um, also, if you had been COVID positive, that doesn't mean you can't see visitors, but you need to have been released from isolation. And that's either based on the symptom or the test-based strategy. So in the facilities, we use a test-based strategy. We require two negative tests before All right, we heard we got muted. I'm not sure how long we've been muted for. I will just go back to the <laughs> um, I will get, thank you, Julie LePage, for listening in the other uh, office and knowing we got muted. We'll just go back real quick and go over this. So a facility to allow for visits, a facility needs to have not had a pop, what the guidance says, a facility should not have had a COVID staff or resident positive for 28 days. Um, limit those visits to outdoors only and only when the residents are negative, not symptomatic or considered no longer COVID positive. Also allowing up to two visitors at one time with social distancing spaced by at least six feet. Good hand hygiene before and after each visit for both the resident and the visitors and use of a cloth face covering or face mask for both the resident and the visitor. Now we do recognize that not all residents can safely wear face masks in the event that they cannot do that. It is recommended that a plastic partition or a plexiglass barrier be considered to prevent the spread of the virus. So put that between them. A shower curtain, we're like a clear shower curtain totally achieves that goal. So um, anyway, those are some things. Also, you want to make sure you screen every visitor that comes to the facility and only, amount, only allow in visitors that meet your screening criteria. Um, so again, we will post this out on our website. You want to make sure you keep visitor logs. You want to sanitize any outdoor areas, including tables, chairs, and partitions between each and every visit. That's the guidance for uh, long-term care facility visits. They've also, which would apply a lot to what we're doing too, and is good advice for us as well. They're also looking at guidance for communal dining and group activities. And again, same, same limited preferences up front. You know, make sure you haven't had an outbreak for 28 days. 
Um, still limit dining and group activities only to the residents who are negative or not symptomatic or are considered, for lack of a better term, recovered from COVID. <clears throat> you still want to allow those residents to eat in the same room, but you want to impact social distancing, that's six feet apart, hand hygiene and cloth face coverings and face masks while not eating for so the rest of the time they're together. Um, generally, you still restrict group activities, but you can allow those with social distancing, good hand hygiene, and again, the use of cloth face coverings or face masks if they are available. Also, um, so that, those are really the two key guidelines. They're still looking at overall guidelines for reopening for nursing homes, and we will share those when they're available. But there's a lot of good tips in there and a lot of good ways to help try to get families back together, which is what we're really hoping for. Don't forget, too, we did post a planning guide out on our website for people to utilize to help try to make decisions on visiting, accessing the community, all of those things as well. So I still want to say it is an individual decision, and um, we need to make sure we keep in mind the uh, rights, desires, and needs of the individuals that we're supporting. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is ISPs, authorizations, and backlogs. The ISP authorization backlog, sorry. So one of uh, the challenges that we have in our system, part of it's the way it's set up, part of it is communication. There's, a lot, always, there's always a good reason why we have a backlog in authorizations, or there's always a reason. I don't want to say good. There's always a reason why there is a backlog on an authorization for an ISP but we have got to do a better job of getting those cleared up. And I say that because our providers are struggling right now. And if they've got billables and they cannot, they are taking care of people. And if they cannot get those billables billed, they cannot get paid. And we have got to get that money out to them. So if you are currently supervising support coordination, either for the state or privately, please check to see if you have people contributing to this problem. We know it is both in state case management and in private case management. We've, we're working with those individuals, but please, as an agency director or lead, please check into this because we need to make sure that our providers are getting paid. They are delivering these supports today. Um, and really, we've had, we've had a several months here with no travel and no face-to-face -face visits, so it's been a good opportunity to try to clean up as much of that stuff as you can, and that's going to be coming to an end, and we want to make sure that you're still focusing on it, even though we're going to try to pick up on making visits with individuals, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. Um, so, okay, that, <clears throat> that's that. With that, I do kind of want to talk about our reentry plan, reopening plan. Right now, our target date is July 1st. I say that because what I'm going to say and what Wendy's going to say and what Gary's going to say is going to tr trigger a lot of questions, and that is good. We want it to trigger a lot of questions because we need help as we try to figure this out. We've never done this before. Um, but with that said, our plan is to open regional offices by appointment only, so they will not be open to the public. We are still limiting staff access to regional offices because we do want to keep our densities down in the regional offices. And so, uh, but we do want to make sure that if you are from the public and you need an appointment with a regional office, you can get in there and get that taken care of at this time. Apparently, it kicked Heike off, and now Angie is hosting it. So she's doing a great job. Thank you, Angie. Um, so the regional offices will still not be open to the public, generally speaking, but they will be open by appointment only. We are still going to keep our density down in the regional offices, and supervisors will be working with staff in the regional offices to identify if, when, how they need to reaccess the office if they have not been doing so up to this point. Staff who want to return to work, and we know that we have staff that want to return to work and get into the office, they need to work with their supervisors to coordinate schedules to avoid over overcrowding in the offices. Again, returning to the office is not required for individuals who have been able to successfully accomplish their work from home at this time. Also, starting July 1st, we're going to start working on support coordinators doing distance meetings. I would really like to see our monthly monitoring start on July 1st with distance meetings, just like we kind of talked about with that nursing home guidance for visiting. 
So, um, and I guarantee that is going to generate a lot of questions and that's why I'm saying it right now. I wanna see what those questions you need us to answer. Anytime you're doing any sort of distance meetings, or anytime you're coming into the office for an appointment at a regional office, you need to be wearing face coverings. Our face coverings, all the things that we just talked about with the uh, long-term care uh, visiting policy would apply for just daily work as well. So I wanna make sure people understand that. Face coverings, six feet apart. If you can't do that, let's try to find a way to put some sort of, of plexiglass, clear shower curtain, something in the way so that you can do the work that needs to be done. Um, also, monitoring functions will resume from the regional office side, but only in provider offices. We will not be going into homes at this point in time. Again, our goal is not to go into the homes, but our goal is to do as much of the work we can do this summer right now so that we can uh, make sure that folks are safe and well taken care of. So that is where we're at right now. We do have 472 people on the call today so far, so thank you. Define distance meetings. So, so there, the question came in. Again, you go to um, an individual who lives in an individual supported living arrangement. You guys meet outside, you're six feet apart, you're asking your questions, you're doing your monitoring visit. So there's parts of your monitoring visit that would require you to go inside. Those parts we're not asking you to start doing at this point, but we do wanna make some face-to-face -face contact with individuals at this point. So that's what I mean. But you still gotta be six feet apart, you still gotta wear your mask, you still, the, those things are all important and, and need to be adhered to at this point. Okay, with that, I am going to turn it over to Wendy. And I don't have um, a whole lot to share. We're gonna talk just a little bit about stories from the field. We've had a suggestion and a request that we open it up to more people who would like to listen. And so we're going to be opening it up to providers CCM providers and service providers and our state staff who want to um, hear from our panel about that are talking about what's going on in their agencies and in their areas. So we're gonna give that a try, not starting next week, but the week after. So um, next week, actually, we are going to not have our stories from the field call because we are gonna make that time available for an HHS Provider Relief Fund webcast that airs at that time on Tuesday. June 23rd from one to two. We're good, it's still okay. If, we're, if you're not able to participate at that time, um, there's another opportunity on Thursday, June 25th from one to two, and we'll be posting information on that. So um, no stories from the field on next Tuesday. Those folks that were scheduled for Tuesday, we will reschedule you for the following week. So, and that is all I have, Gary. Right. So this is um, falls under the category of other news. So most of you are aware the division did a, an RFP for a new case management system to pull our waiver and TCM services out of Seymour. Um, we finished the evaluation some time ago, but the award has been under protest. Well, we think the protest is pretty close to being answered. So we're going to begin work pretty soon. So that project is still going. And once again, that was a CMS approved funding project. So um, it's still good to go. As, and I, we think work will be starting pretty soon. Very good. So if you have any questions about that or anything, um, just please let us know, but. Announce your other thing? Yep. Oh, <laughs> so Val's want me to share more. Um, so we've announced internally that I'm going to be retiring effective September 1, um, but. Hopefully we'll still be able to contribute in some ways, but now looking forward to that. Um, and there we go. Just thought it was time. Congratulations, Gary. So um, he will be well. He will be missed across the department and across the state. You all have been working with Gary for how many years, Gary? Oh, be, it'll be 34 years plus. No, oh, doesn't seem that long, but. <laughs> Time flies, time flies, yeah. Yeah. very, very good. So, um, and the world keeps spinning. Yes, every it day, does, yes, every it day. does. All right, what else we got on that agenda? Kim. Over you, Kim. Just real quick, testing. Um, again, just to reiterate what Val said, we are wrapping up next week with our communications with any of our residential um, group home service providers. Then we're gonna start reaching out to our residential ISL service providers who we have not already communicated with. So please be looking for the correspondence and please, 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 
make sure that you're going out to the DD mailbox and letting us know if you are or are not interested in testing efforts. Okay. And if you are and you start doing your testing efforts, please make sure that you're providing us your updates on all the great work that you're doing around baseline testing. Can't thank everybody enough for that important area of ongoing support to individuals. And just that also, as um, Val mentioned, with the distance meetings for TCM, we are wanting to start working and collaborating with you as well as you're starting to make those important decisions and we will work to support you on any identified baseline testing efforts within your respective agencies that you may have as well. So be looking for some additional guidance and correspondence from the division regarding those efforts. Absolutely. And guys, any meeting needs to be a distance meeting. You should always be six feet away from people. And if you're not, you need to be, you should be wearing a face mask. But if you're not six feet away from people, you should absolutely be wearing a face mask. So I just want to make sure that it, the, the type of meeting doesn't dictate whether distance is necessary or not. COVID-19 is still active in the community. It is still active in the state of Missouri. And distancing is still the best way to prevent from getting COVID-19. So as Gary backs away. No. <laughs> too close to the phone. He's too close to the phone. So anyway, I mean, nothing, nothing around social distancing changes. You still need to try to keep that six foot apart from people as much as you as much as you can. And when you can, you still need to make sure you're wearing a mask. So wear a mask. Please wear a mask. And um, consider, I mean, consider the HIPAA options. You know, for your planning meetings. So if you can't have them at a scheduled appointment meeting at the regional office, for example, you can do them. Um, over Zoom or or WebEx or right. in the backyard if, if it's private enough in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Those approved technology platforms that we've identified in our, our memorandums that came out early on, nothing's oh. changed. Nothing has changed yeah. on that. So anything else from the question box, Gary? No. All right. Have a happy Friday. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers out there this weekend. And happy first day of summer. And all the great things that happen Juneteenth. this time of the year. So, and Juneteenth, yes, another celebration. So, this is a great three days we have coming up. All right, thank you all. Good luck. Wear your mask. Bye.